I'm Mick Baghdadi from Mix Motorsport, and I'm happy to be a Haltech hero today. That's my personal car. Um, I had a brain snap one day, bought it, started building it, and Cudamundra, I wanted to go to Cudamundra and the Flying 500, and that's all we set our mind on, just to do that. We wanted to try and be the fastest street registered Evo in Australia, or in the world, if we can. And it's uh, pretty much up there. It's the fastest in Australia. And I think we are the fastest in the world, full weight, with the radial tyres. It'd be safe to say that Mick's Red Evo is one of the most recognisable race cars in Australia. After finishing runner-up at the 2016 Motive DVD drag battle, the car went on to win the TurboSmart Flying 500 at the World Time Attack Challenge later in the same year. Like getting into Evos, it was the most popular car, you know, like 2006, 2007, everyone was starting to you know, buy them and do them up slowly, slowly. So we purchased one back then, started to do kits for them, like stage one, stage two, stage three. Then we got into the SR20 stuff. And then we came back to the Evo, started building them, and we ended up building this car. We went straight to the top shelf. We went and bought the best of pretty much everything as in gearbox, clutches, engine. The car makes a mind-blowing 1,238 horsepower at all four wheels with 74 pounds of boost pressure. That amount of power does come at a price though, as it puts an enormous strain on all the engine and driveline components. The first time we got it going, we broke the clutch pretty much within two minutes, uh, which broke the bell housing of the gearbox. The gearbox is worth, you know, close to $20,000 and we were shocked. Then we broke the transfer case. And that's been a nightmare, breaking transfer case. We've broken probably about 20. There's a lot, of, definitely a lot of challenges when it comes to four wheel drive setting them up and that. It's uh, not as easy as people think it is. Of course, all that power is not generated by a stock factory Evo engine. The 4G mix car is a billet 2.2 litre block with a stroker billet crank, manly rods and high compression CP pistons. Up the top, a ported head uses big valves and aggressive Kelford camshafts. But there's so much more to this setup than just the engine. Allow me to explain. Being that the Evo 8's got an east-west orientated engine and it's got the front wheel drive style gearbox with the transfer case that goes down the back, these things are already so crowded in factory form. But then we've got this monster. That engine bay is busy. And making that boost pressure is a precision 7685 turbocharger. It's got two wastegates that control the boost pressure. So in a setup like this, the wastegate setup is very, very particular where even though the thing's running 70 pounds of boost pressure, it's more about the control of actually getting the boost pressure there and being able to lower the boost in lesser gears. So in first and second gear, for example, we want to drop boost pressure by directing exhaust flow around the turbine housing straight out the exhaust to lower the boost pressure. You couldn't do that with just one wastegate. That's why this thing's got two. With so much air being compressed and forced into that engine, we need to mix it with a hell of a lot of fuel in order to get good, consistent and safe air to fuel ratios. So to do that, we've got a plasma man intake manifold, we've got a plasma man fuel rail, and that fuel rail houses two Siemens Decker 2200cc injectors per cylinder. Those injectors are operated through the Haltech ECU in a staged sequential format. So what that means is we've got one primary set of injectors, which is one 2200cc injector per cylinder. Then as the engine RPM comes up, and as the boost and engine demand gets stronger, so let's say, for example, at about 10 or 15 pounds of boost pressure, we then stage into the second set of injectors. That way we turn both injectors on when the engine's making high power. You come off the throttle, 
it transitions back to the primary injectors and drives a little bit nicer because you're not trying to drive the thing when you've got about 4,400 cc of injector per cylinder. Hidden under the carbon fiber boot lid is a big blue bottle of happiness. But it's not just used to make outright power. We use the nitrous for two things. We use it for off the line to try not to let it bog. It's very tricky to get it off the line. Wastegate pressure off the line on this car still makes 480 kilowatts. So it's obviously way too much power for taking off at the, at the drags. So we've got a turbo smart bleed valve to bleed the boost out off the line. But we're also using the nitrous to try just in case it wants to bog to try and put a bit of nitrous in and turns back off straight away. It works between five pound of boost and 20 off the line. And then it's there in case you do want to use the top end. It's on the switch, on the button, on the steering wheel, which we have used. We're not going to say we haven't used it. That's how we've managed to run over just over 170 mile an hour. And it's definitely got more to go, so. In order to supply the huge amount of fuel volume that this car needs, it's actually got a really, really impressive, as well as very simple fuel system. Firstly, we've got our factory fuel tank in the boot of the car, and it's just got one upgraded, normal, high pressure fuel pump. It uses factory lines that bring the fuel up into this can right here. Then, it's also got a return using the factory line going back to the tank in the boot. So this tank is kind of acting as a surge tank in a way at the front of the car. We've then got a huge line that comes off the bottom of this tank that goes up into our Kinsler mechanical fuel pump that's mounted here on the front of the camshaft. Then that line feeds into the fuel rail all the way back around through the TurboSmart FPR 200 fuel pressure regulator and then returns into the tank. What's really cool there is the fuel pressure regulator is actually mounted straight to the end of the tank. So it gets rid of a few fittings, makes use of the space in that corner because as we said before, the, the space sort of is really limited in here. Often a car that relies solely on a mechanical fuel pump is pretty hard to start. This one's not, it starts straight away. And the reason for that is a bit of really clever thinking. What the guys have done They've also mounted an external fuel pump here. Looks something like a Bosch 040 or something that might have been like a, a VL Commodore equivalent, something like that. This thing doesn't need to supply a huge amount of fuel. All it needs to do is supply enough fuel to prime the system and get the engine running. And how that works is it's got another feed out of the bottom of the tank in the front here into this EFI fuel pump. Then the feed line from that actually comes up and back feeds the fuel pressure regulator. It's configured so that when you turn the key on and crank the engine, that fuel pump is powered up, it back feeds the system, it puts pressure through the fuel rail, then the engine can start and run. As soon as the engine starts and runs, the mechanical fuel pump takes over and that's the pump that's supplying the, power, the, the fuel for the high horsepower. Uh, I've been into cars probably since I was eight, nine years old. I started driving, my brother taught me to drive when I was 10, 11. Yeah, my first car was a Holden Gemini, a 1976 model, uh, which I bought and started modifying it and slowly, slowly and doing what we had to do to it. And uh, we ended up building a quick, normally aspirated engine to run 11 seconds down the quarter mile in the late 90s. Till today, no one's beaten that time. Uh, it still holds the record. In actual fact, there's a class they've got on Facebook something about normally aspirated four-cylinder Geminis. We're still number one, and the closest to it, I think, is like 13.9, 14.0. So I do feel really at home in this interior. I used to have an Evo 9. It was probably the fav my, my most favourite car. Um, in here, it's just it's nowhere near as comfortable. I've driven a heap of fairly powerful cars, a bunch of 1,000 horsepower street cars. Um, this thing's well over that. It's pretty. It is hard to drive. Um, the sequential makes it fairly tricky on the street, but the power band that it's got is uncomfortable. And in saying that, under about 3,000 RPM, because of the configuration, a stock Evo's probably got more power on it, and that's kind of when you're putting around on the street. This obviously wasn't built for that. This thing is made to give it a hard time, and on the street, I, I have no idea how people do this. It's crazy.
The engine's controlled by a Haltech Elite 2500 series ECU with an IQ3 logger dash displaying all the necessary ECU data via a CAN connection. All Elite's race functions get a workout in this car with the race timer used to control the launch and boost by gear strategy engaged to prevent the loss of traction at all four wheels. The main feature in this interior for me is the billet Samsonis gear shifter. Very, very nice piece of gear. The thing's got a six speed sequential gearbox. That means that as we're pulling and pushing up on this gear knob, it's sort of like a motorbike. So we ratchet through the gears. So it's got reverse, neutral, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got the display up on the dash here. We've got a load cell on the shaft that pulls and pushes on the gear selector shaft that's on the gearbox, which that's a direct shaft. It's not a cable or anything like that. That load cell tells the engine management system how hard we're pushing or pulling on the load cell. The engine management system then cuts our engine power between gears to unload the gear set. Um, I want to talk about this a little bit more, so I'm going to put this car on the dyno. We'll run it through the gears and we'll see how this sequential box works. Now I'm not going to get too carried away on the dyno. Over a thousand horsepower, drag style tyres, four wheel drive, billet 4G. I don't want to put K's on this thing and I don't want to wear the drivetrain out. So what I really wanted to do was put it on the dyno. First, blow some cobwebs out of it because it gets driven in and out of the shop cold every day. But more importantly, I wanted to show you how the sequential gearbox works. I want to do some upshifting, some downshifting. I wanted you to very specifically watch the clutch pedal and show you when I'm using the clutch and when I'm not. First and foremost, earmuffs on. This thing is going to be noisy. You know that a sequential gearbox is working when it's really noisy. We're going to be super aggressive with the shifts because if you're not aggressive and you slowly pull it in, you're going to damage the edge of those gears or the, the dog teeth. And then before you know it, gearbox will be out and you'll be rebuilding it. Here we go. We're going to pull it into first gear, clutch in to get it into first. Give it some revs because it's got no bottom end torque and let it rip. Here we go. We're away. So we're cruising in first gear right now. We've got a GPS based speedo, so I'm watching the speed on the dyno. First gear. Here we go. First gear, my foot's up here, so I'm not using the clutch. Ah, second. Pull. Third. One more time. So we're in neutral, we're sitting at a set of lights, we put the clutch in, first gear, the gear detector says first, we take off, here we go. First, all right, we'll race the guy beside us. Up, go, go, first. Come off the throttle, on the throttle, off the throttle, it stays in gear. I could just knock it back into fourth. On, off, on, off. Come back down as if we're slowing up for a set of lights. So clutch in, rev, third. Clutch in, rev, second. Clutch in, rev, first. Clutch in, back to neutral, stop. Whoa. I'll wait for all of these fans to cool down a little bit. So even on the dyno, it is an adventure. Gearboxes like this, they are rattly, they're clunky, they're noisy, but that's part of the whole adventure of driving a car like this. The best ETs this car's run at the moment is 8.9 seconds down the quarter on radials. And I think best mile now it's gone is just over 171 mile per hour. In the future, we want to try and definitely better our ETs. 
We know we can do it. Just trying to find the right driver that can do it. More experience with a manual car. I can't drive it anymore, obviously, you know. So pretty much this car's perfect. It's the way it has to be. There's no other way, you know.